Welcome or welcome back. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you officially to the Fulbright Association's 43rd annual conference. Before we begin, I want to thank many people and institutions that have made this conference, our first offered virtually, possible. These include my team in Washington, especially Shaz Akram and Munir Sayah, our conference committees led by Melanie Horton and Rob Lively, our national board of directors, and our generous donors and sponsors. I would especially like to recognize those sponsors, Rice University, the University of Pennsylvania, Auburn University, the University of Alabama, the National Peace Corps Association, Stranger's Guide, the University of Arkansas, the Institute of International Education, and the Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. I want to thank our membership for their support and engagement, and all of you for attending. Thank you very much. This year has been the most disruptive and the most destructive since the terrible years of World War II. That post-war world was battered, exhausted, and wounded from the unimaginable but very real destruction of combat, nuclear war, starvation, and Holocaust. Yet the world arose from that moment to create the United Nations, the Marshall Plan, and the Fulbright Program. The resilience of humanity was tested then, and it is being tested now, as we face an invisible viral enemy and the crescendo of the most conflicted political culture in memory. As he pondered the future, Martin Luther King Jr. asked, where do we go from here? His treatise on social issues and justice, which tragically was his last book, grew from a need bred in the bone among humans that we gain strength from imagining the future. We reaffirm our values when we choose hope over despair, and we roll up our sleeves and get to work more effectively when we have a plan. And that is why we chose this year's conference theme, where does the world go from here? In asking Fulbrighters and Friends of International Exchange to tackle forward-thinking issues and ideas, the Fulbright Association embraces Dr. King's challenge. These next three days, then, will be much more than an opportunity to grow and learn. It will be a moment in the shadow of the most consequential election in generations to embrace the future and fill it with energy, ideas, and goodwill. After a powerful first session on race, racism, and diversity, we offer you this opening plenary. Introducing and moderating our opening plenary with an extraordinary panel of leaders and thinkers is national board member, Dr. Carolyn Lavander. Dr. Lavander is a respected leader in international education, serving as Vice President for Global and Digital Strategy at Rice University in Houston, Texas. She recently led an International Rockefeller Foundation Summit on the future of global university, drawing thought leaders from around the world together to incubate new approaches to learning. Carolyn helps the students and faculty of Rice reimagine their engagement in the world directly and digitally, so it made perfect sense that she would serve the same role for us today. Please welcome Dr. Carolyn Lavander. Thank you so much, John, for a wonderful introduction uh, for myself, but also for this very important plenary. And um, it is my honor and privilege to moderate a discussion around five key themes of urgent concern to all of us into our world today. Activism, racial equity, global markets, health, education, doesn't get more important than this. And to inform our conversation today, we have excellent speakers who each separately bring a wealth of wisdom, of remarkable accomplishment to the question at hand. I will introduce each speaker separately before they offer their insights. 
they will offer those insights for five to seven minutes each so that we will have plenty of time for questions and conversation, lively discussion before the plenary ends. A note for, for all audience members, you are welcome to use the chat function in Zoom, selecting all panelists and all attendees. And please, if you're comfortable, share where you're now located as well as where you did your Fulbright. That gives us a sense of the audience and the community we convene today. However, please submit your questions through the Q&A, which panelists and I will monitor. When typing a question, if you can, please begin with the name of the panelist, followed by the question. And if you could keep your questions brief and focused, we'd appreciate it so we can get as many questions in as possible. Please note, even though we, we have 10 minutes for each panelist, we're really going for a briefer uh, five to seven minute opening set of observations to optimize discussion time. And so I will begin today, and I ask all panelists if you're comfortable to, um, to start your video so we can bring the panel together. Um, I, will, I will begin by introducing our first panelist, Malik Poncheloy, the award-winning actor, author, activist, whose career has spanned hit TV shows like 30 Rock, Weeds, and Whitney, his animated favorites include Phineas and Ferb, Sanjay and Craig. He's been on Broadway and in film. His debut novel, The Best At It, was named a 2020 Stonewall Honor Book, among many other honors. And he was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Currently, he is co-founder of the anti-bullying campaign acttochange.org. He will speak today about activism, bullying, and America. Please welcome Malik. Did you want me to hop in, Carolyn, or are you doing other intros first? You go oh, right okay. ahead, and then I'll enter the next. I'm, I didn't follow directions well. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm so honored to get to kick off this session. Um, I was not a Fulbright scholar, so I don't know if by getting doing this, I get like an honorary Fulbright, but send it my way if you want. Um, I thought I would uh, briefly share with you a little bit about my own um, story and why I'm doing the work that I do now. Um, and to do that, I feel like I got to go way back, but bear with me. I'll keep it, I'll keep it brief. So I grew up I was a scrawny, brown, nerdy, Indian American kid. And we lived in places like Ohio, Indiana, uh, Texas, and Florida, which um, I love those places, but they are not the most, uh, they're not the bastions of liberality and inclusivity that, uh, that, that a young, scrawny, 12 year old, gay Indian American boy uh, needed. And then, and then speaking about being gay, when I was 12, this movie, uh, Top Gun, came out and I'm wondering if any of you have seen that movie. Um, there's a very famous locker room scene in it where Tom Cruise is in a towel and my 12 year old self could not stop watching uh, this movie on repeat. And I realized at that moment that I was probably gay and as if it wasn't hard enough being brown and scrawny and nerdy in, in very largely white places that focused on athleticism and sports, uh, suddenly, uh, uh, being gay was like a whole a whole new thing. So the one thing that I found um, a lot of comfort in as a kid was stories. I loved reading books. I loved watching television. I loved watching movies so much so that I knew at a very early age that I wanted to be an actor. But I had an issue because the the books that I read, the TV shows I watched, and the movies that we went to reinforced a lot of the shame and self-loathing that I was starting to build up because the narratives, the stories in those books, TV shows and movies, uh, I never saw characters like me. I never saw uh, brown kids. I never saw gay kids. And so my story was effectively being erased. So that's just a little bit of a background. I, I persevered. I knew I wanted to be an actor. And luckily, I was able to forge a career uh, as an actor. And I started to be able to offer that kind of representation that I so badly needed uh, back to other people, whether it was 
being on 30 Rock or Weeds or Whitney or more directly for young people, uh, playing Bajit on Phineas and Ferb or playing Sanjay on, on Sanjay and Craig and getting to see young people see a version of themselves on TV and light up just reinforced for me how important representation uh, is. Now I had a turning point because with the visibility that television offered me, I suddenly got asked to uh, to engage in public service in a way much, not unlike what, what is happening here today. Uh, but largely the organizations that asked me to come speak or support their work happened to be Asian American organizations or LGBTQ organizations. And interestingly enough, these were two parts of my identity that I had spent a long time running away from because I saw them as liabilities rather than as assets. So this was a turning point for me. And I had this moment where I decided I can either continue to isolate and run away from who I am, or I can step up to the plate and tell the story that I believe in and stand up for what I think is right. And I seized that moment and I, I did a lot of activism work that led to, as Caroline uh, said, an appointment by President Barack Obama in 2014 to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And while I was there, because I saw so badly uh, how young people needed representation and needed to have their voices heard, the thing that I took up was anti-bullying work uh, for Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, youth. Um, what we were seeing was that there were really high rates of bullying against Asian American and Pacific Islander kids, sometimes twice the national average. But there was very little reporting and very little conversation happening in communities. So we formed an anti-bullying campaign called Act to Change. Um, initially, it was a White House campaign. And the, the goal of it as a White House campaign was to not only elevate the conversation, but also to, uh, to get communities to report incidents so that the federal government could intervene. Cut to 2017, uh, and this is not meant to be political, it's just what was happening. Suddenly there was so much anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant rhetoric coming out of the White House that the job of going to say a South Asian uh, Muslim person and saying, hey, if your kid is being bullied, you can report it to the White House, uh, felt, felt disingenuous. The work no longer could happen under the White House. So myself and a couple of White House folk, we moved act to change outside of the White House. Uh, in, in its initial years, we were just like a couple people trying to keep the work alive. We have grown immensely uh, in the last three years. We, we now have a robust working board and advisory council of luminaries like Tan France from Queer Eye and editor-in-chief of Allure Magazine, Michelle Lee, and uh, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General under Obama. And because we, we have stayed active, when the coronavirus hit and suddenly anyone who looked Chinese was the victim of bullying and harassment and violence, we were able to step in and do a lot of really needed work for the community. And mostly what that has looked like because we were in a virtual world was virtual events that we got uh, incredible speakers for who spoke directly uh, to young people. And these, these webinars started to get tens of thousands of views online and to really fill a need in the community. And I, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but I just wanna say that, that something that we're really focused on right now is this idea that communities of color really have to stand up for each other. So when George Floyd was murdered, we uh, immediately pivoted to bringing black voices to the table and to talking about how communities of color must stand together in solidarity. For Pride Month, we focused on Black Trans Lives Matter and how without the movement that black trans people started in this country, Asian American and Pacific Islander youth who are LGBTQ would not uh, uh, have the rights that they have now. And so this has become a big focus. And I just wanna say that I feel, uh, we have a youth conference by the way, coming up this Saturday, October 24th. And you can find more information on that at our website, which Caroline uh, mentioned. But I just wanna say that I feel very hopeful in terms of where we go from here, because I'm seeing a galvanizing of communities uh, uh, coming together to stand up for each other. And part of the reason that I wanted to bring up my story to all of you is that that, that turning point I had in my own life where it was like, what is important to me and am I willing to put myself on the line to stand up for it is something that I'm seeing happening around the world right now where communities are standing up for each other. But I think the, the way to keep that forward momentum happening is by continuing to tell our stories and hold people's feet to the fire around their commitments that they are making 
uh, right now to be more inclusive and to be uh, be more equitable. So I'll leave it with that and hopefully we'll have some time for um, questions later. Thank you. Malik, that was wonderful and inspiring. Um, and we will carry those, those takeaways with us throughout this plenary. It's my great privilege and delight to introduce Shakira Simley next. She is director of the Office of Racial Equity for the city and county of San Francisco. And in this role, she's responsible for advancing citywide racial equity framework um, to address the history of institutional structural racism um, and also the internal practices and systems that mitigate against greater racial equity today. She previously <clears throat> worked in food policy and community development, operated an artisan preserves company to channel a passion for social justice into improving the nation's food system. And it's in this context, she completed her Fulbright year in Palenzo, Italy, where she studied for her master's degree at the University of Gastronomic Services. Today, we're delighted she's gonna speak on race relations and diversity. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much really for your amazing comments. I feel like it's a, an amazing thread to what I'll be speaking about. And um, good morning from California, from San Francisco. I do have some slides to share with everyone just to keep the energy going, if that's okay. Um, so just give me one second. Our brave new digital world we have here. Can everyone see my slides? Thumbs up. We good? Okay. I'm an educator, so I like engagement. <laughs> okay. So um, as Carolyn said, my name is Shakira Simley. I'm the director for the Office of Racial Equity in the city and county of San Francisco. My Fulbright journey started in a way in which I could have never imagined. I am, uh, you know, as I am a you know, young uh, working class black kid from Harlem. I was raised by a single mom uh, where I helped her. She as a licensed social worker um, raised my five um, brothers and sisters against the backdrop of New York City in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I never thought I would ever receive this sort of opportunity um, almost 10 years ago to study in Italy and follow my dreams. I'm one of the only people in my family that has a passport um, that has ever really left the country. And, um, you know, my Fulbright experience really set the course, not just for my professional life um, at the intersection of food and justice and race and gender, but also set the course for my activism and fighting against systemic racism. So I am extremely grateful for that ex experience and I'm very dedicated to making sure that our, our kids around the world and our, and our, you know, our black and brown kids here in the United States who, you know, don't know what it's like to um, leave uh, this country besides reading a book, which is what I did for most of my life, but until I was 24, having the opportunity to go abroad and so that you can do that too. So I'm, I'm really passionate about that. Um, and, you know, we are in a moment of tremendous pain, but I want to make sure that we understand um, and sit in our resilient selves that pain is important. And what we're going through right now is incredibly important. And as Audre Lorde says, we can't evade it. Um, we need to think about how we succumb to it, how we deal with it and how we transcend it. So we can't just get over it or under it. We have to get through it. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that we can take from this pandemic and thinking about how we can transcend, but do that together. Um, and part of my work in doing that transcendence is transforming systems to advance collective liberation in San Francisco, particularly for our BIPOC, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, with inside city government, outside city government. And when we talk about equity, I think it's really important. We're not talking about equality, we're talking about justice, and we're talking about freedom, and how we can create a world and dismantle systems of oppression in which all of us can feel free. Um, and I feel like COVID and the pandemic is an incredible backdrop to that work. Um, and I also want to make sure we're grounded in our understanding of what kind of systems we're up against. Um, I always tell folks our system of uh, racism and white supremacy is one of the best designed systems ever created. It is cumulative, it is pervasive, and it's durable. And in order for us to uh, um, take an approach to dismantle that system and look at how those joint institutions work, we need to think about um, our bodies our and, and ourselves as individuals, but also how we connect across communities. 
Um, and I also want to make sure that folks understand in doing this work, we have to lead with race. Um, systemic racism is the basis for so many different structural issues across society. And if we're able to start there and to look at our history, um, look in that mirror, um, take accountability and work towards being actively anti-racist, we can start to unravel um, these horrendous systems that are currently at play um, in American society and globally today. Um, and again, we, you know, we talk about COVID and I want to provide that context here where we see COVID up against a backdrop of, you know, of systemic oppression. So particularly in San Francisco, and I was deployed as an essential worker for three months um, on the front lines, um, working to push equity in San Francisco's uh, COVID response. So in regards to cases, transmission, um, hospitalizations, folks in the ICU and deaths, that has overwhelmingly been our Black, Latinx, and AEPI communities. And that's up against a backdrop of health disparities, of our criminal justice system, of housing issues and homelessness. Um, and we cannot let this continue to happen on our watch. Um, and this is a really important uh, slide for me and just to contextualize like how we're thinking about this problem. So on one side, you see our San Francisco uh, residential zone map from the 1940s. And it tells you where redlining is happening and where neighborhoods that were deemed hazardous um, so therefore, uh, communities could not get bank loans or financing in order to uh, build up uh, equity and take care of themselves. Up against a backdrop of our COVID maps where we see the prevalence of uh, the virus. And this is not a mistake. So this is the system that we're up against. So my question for everyone today is how can you push for justice and support for our community in the middle of a pandemic? Um, a couple of things. Uh, number one, we have to show up and show out, right? Now is the time. If you haven't taken it to the streets yet, I'll meet you there. Uh, we need mutual aid. We need coalitions. We need to show up for our neighbors and our communities to protect our democracy. We need to shift power. And, and this is incredibly important to me. And understand who has the ability can, to exercise control and to exercise systems as legitimated by the status quo. And we need to disrupt that. And we also need to prioritize intersectionality, right? So understand how systems of oppression work across each other and understand who has the right to be healthy. And also we have to vote. This is my ballot. I have to send it in ASAP, right? So that's another piece of this work that I'm really hoping that we all can do together. Um, I will put this in the chat. I uh, co-authored a racial equity toolkit for COVID it has a bunch of really important recommendations that you can use and bring to your communities and how we can make change on a systemic and policy and individual level in fighting COVID, um, not just in the, not in the disaster response, but also for recovery. So I wanna lift that up as an offering to community. Um, and also we have our own personal revolutions um, that we can put in our ordinary lives, right? This is not something that's left to the activists. It's left to all of us and everyone has the capability to do this work. Um, and then there's just a couple of things I just want to uplift uh, before I end. So, you know, centering empathy and accountability. How can we take responsibility and reject complicity in this system that doesn't serve anyone, anyone? Um, how can we break down silos and build coalitions to have meaningful linkages between communities? So Malik said he talked about, you know, in the, uh, uh, um, this year and thinking about the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, how do we cross intersect our movements from bullying to, you know, dismantling uh, police violence and make sure that we all can feel seen and um, show up for one another. And one thing I like to say, I know self care is like really hip right now, but self care is actually community care. So when we take care of each other, we can take care of ourselves. And also, lastly, decolonize everything, right? This is a time of disruption. Um, RMD uh, Roy says that pandemic, the pandemic is a portal, right? It's a time in which we can transform and sometimes disruption is helpful. And I want us to hold, um, hold that. And lastly, um, I wanna have this closing thought. Hope is a discipline. Um, and this is from freedom fighter Marami Kamba, where she talks about hope is a daily practice. It's a muscle. It's something that we must use every single day. And I want us to be rigorous in our hope and I want us to be rigorous in our practice. And I want us to be rigorous in protecting our democracy because um, that's the only thing that we can do in order to show up for one another. So again, I am so um, happy and excited um, to be here. I would have never thought upon receiving that Fulbright letter um, over 10 years ago that I would be here speaking to all of you. Um, so I humbly um, give it back to the rest of the panel and I look forward to answering more questions from our community.
So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakira. Those are inspiring words, um, really compelling visual data. Um, we love the, the ending that hope is a discipline. And um, you know, we want to encourage you as you listen to each of these wonderful um, set of comments to include your questions in the Q&A uh, as we go. You don't need to wait until the end. So please don't hesitate to add questions as you listen. Our third speaker is Krishna Guha, who heads global policy and central bank strategy team in Washington, DC. In the 2019 Institutional Investor All-America Research Team, Evercore ISA's policy team was ranked number one, and Mr. Guha was ranked number one as an individual. Prior to joining that firm, he was executive vice president, member of the management committee, head of, head of the communications group, at the New York Fed from 2010 to 13. And while there, he led New York Fed's external relations, acted as a senior advisor to President William Dudley on monetary policy strategy, policy communication, and served as a member of the Fed's executive committee on financial stability and regulatory policy. He's also chaired the Fed's policy speech writing process, co-chaired its housing policy working group, and managed a department of about 60 officials. Uh, he was a member of the management committee where he shared responsibility for charting overall strategy of the Fed, developing its capabilities and managing its risks uh, in the process. And he will be speaking on global and US financial markets. Thanks for that, that uh, very generous and uh, perhaps uh, overly detailed uh, bio introduction, but I'll take it. Uh, welcome to everybody, and thanks to the panelists who've already spoken for really inspiring comments. Um, the topic I've been given is less intrinsically inspirational, but let me, let me just try to tackle a few of the issues that relate to the intersection of the, the themes that some of the speakers have already raised with the economic and financial experience that we're going through right now. So, I think it's important to, to just sort of register at the outset a few really important stylized facts about this COVID crisis and how it's playing out through the economy and financial markets. So the first thing is that this is an unprecedented economic shock, as well as an unprecedented public health crisis. We saw around the world in the second quarter of this year, unprecedented declines in economic activity and in employment. Uh, even in those parts of the world where furlough programs essentially kept people on subsidized payrolls, the destruction of hours worked was on an unprecedented scale. It's also true that this was an extraordinarily asymmetric shock. So it hit the whole economy, but it hit a number of sectors far, far worse than others. So you know those sectors, right? We're talking about the sort of so-called high touch or social consumption sectors. So these are sectors like uh, leisure, like parts of retail restaurants, hotels, travel. And that is important because those are sectors which are disproportionately staffed by low income people, regardless of their ethnicity and color. They're also disproportionately staffed uh, by people of color uh, in the United States. And they're also disproportionately staffed by women. And so in the overall context of a devastating economic shock, the hardest burden has fallen on the most disadvantaged groups. Uh, and that is very important as we think about not only how we're managing through this crisis, but how we want to envision the recovery uh, subsequently. So it is, I think, important to say that from an economic perspective, this could have been even worse. The policy response that we got around the world, uh, you know, from the spring onwards, bringing together um, fiscal policy interventions, so obviously that's you know, transfers like unemployment insurance top-ups, uh, PPP aid um, on the one hand, uh, actions to keep credit markets open uh, and aggressive monetary easing by all the world's major central banks. Uh, that was very important in preventing this COVID shock from detonating another global financial crisis of the kind that we had had, you know, uh, a little over a decade ago, 
which would have made things dramatically worse uh, in terms of cutting off the lifeblood of credit to the economy as a whole. And these economic stimulus measures have actually delivered a recovery that at the aggregate level over the last six months is a bit better than most of us economists feared would have been the case you know, back in the darkest days of March and April. But as this general recovery has advanced, what has become clearer and clearer is the sectors and the individuals who are left behind. And I don't think it is um, in, in some, in, in the, the fault necessarily of policymakers who under you know, emergency circumstances and with limit, limits to legal authorities, political constraints and other things, threw together what they could to try to prevent uh, you know, this, this very deep recession from getting worse and worse. But it is, I think, clear that, for instance, with the PPP uh, emergency support, the grants, conditional grants for small businesses, that a relatively high share of that money tended to go to actually uh, more professional services type, uh, higher income small businesses. So not as much the, you know, the real mom and pop uh, stores, but also, again, that from a, a, a race and, and, and identity perspective, ethnic identity perspective, that um, communities of color tended uh, not to have access, be able to access their full share uh, of those of that emergency relief. And more broadly, as you know, middle class and higher income occupations that can easily be transferred online, you know, have snapped back to broadly speaking where they were beforehand. Uh, the plight of the left behind sectors has become even sharper in contrast to the aggregate you know, economic um, experience here. So that's where we've been, where are we going? And so I think it's likely that over the coming months, what had been in the aggregate, a better than expected rebound from appalling economic conditions uh, will slow. It'll slow because we're starting to, we've done the easy part. You know, say, getting the, the lawyers and, and the finance people and the business consultants reconnected on Zoom um, and shifting some of the purchases you know, from stores in your neighborhood to Amazon. Um, all of this, by the way, is necessary. We can't tackle any of the structural injustices and inequalities if we have an economy that's collapsing. So it shouldn't, nobody should be under the illusion that this is an enemy of the things we're talking about here. Um, but it's but as we get deeper into this process, uh, we face much more difficult challenges of trying to restore economic activity in areas which have been worst hit uh, by the pandemic um, and which are hardest to restore without a fundamental breakthrough in terms of the, the health side of this um, itself, which would allow a resumption of, of activity in those typically lower income uh, service sector areas. So um, as we look at you know, where we are going forward, we also have to worry about fiscal support being pulled back earlier than it should have been. You know, this is a, a political problem in the US. Obviously the election context makes it very, very difficult to get uh, the, uh, you know, the, the agreement on a cross party basis in the Congress to deliver more fiscal aid. But there are a lot of families out there, particularly in those worst hit sectors, who are running on fumes right now because they have some savings left over from the uh, UI top ups, from uh, the household re you know, rebate checks that went out in the summer. Um, but they're going to run out, you know, sometime, but you know, some households are running out now, some in the next month or two. And so that hardship is really going to bite at that point. Um, you know, looking further forward, the prospects, and I'll, I'll really sort of conclude on this note, the prospects for the economy next year and beyond, you know, is, is still subject to extraordinary uncertainty. Uh, a lot depends on whether we do get an effective vaccine delivered uh, on a, in a timely basis um, and, and, you know, able to be mass deployed. Uh, if we get that, and if we get a new burst of well-designed fiscal stimulus uh, in the first quarter of next year, and if the Fed, my former employer, you know, continues to be, and, and we can maybe talk about this a little more later on, um, aggressively oriented towards trying to promote really a, a full uh, vision of full employment that includes 
thinking about communities of color and low income groups and so forth. It is actually possible that we could get a reacceleration of aggregate economic growth next year. But I think the distributional challenges and the amplification of the pre existing inequities um, is going to be much harder and is going to require a much more sort of systematic focus uh, of economic policy, as well as, you know, sort of the, the larger social justice uh, activism, if we're going to create a recovery that will serve everyone, that will be inclusive, that will be broad based, and that actually means that we not only, you know, can, can pat ourselves on the back, but the economy as a whole uh, is back in better condition but where we've actually done justice by those who've suffered the most during this experience. So let me pass back uh, to you at this point, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is that is really, uh, really terrific. And I think touches on some of the, the comments that Malik and Shakira have made. So a lot to resonate across panelists. We end um, before I uh, speak very briefly on education with John Sargent, who is co-founder of Broadreach Healthcare. He's a globally recognized innovator focused on technologies of the fourth industrial revolution to radically transform healthcare delivery outcome, outcomes. Broadreach Group in 2003 was co-founded by Sargent and its focus is on improving the health and well-being of underserved populations around the world. John will speak today on healthcare access and equality. Thanks, Carolyn, and uh, good evening from Switzerland. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, and thanks to my fellow panelists for great and inspiring discussions. Um, I'm like Shakira, I'm going to share some slides. Uh, I'm an ex management consultant, and so it's, <laughs> it's really hard to uh, get that out of my system. So I'm going to Share and just let me know if you can see uh, my slides coming up. Yep, perfect. Okay. Sorry, there we go. Okay. So, um, you know, in, in these next eight minutes, I just want to address really sort of three topics. Uh, the first is just give you a quick background who I am, where am I coming from. Uh, and then I think the rest of the discussion is really going to be about. From the healthcare perspective, I, although we've been through a very tragic time uh, in this world, um, we've been disrupted. I think there is actually a case for optimism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally talk about um, our experience um, using fourth industrial revolution um, and tackling uh, COVID-19. Um, so very quickly, uh, Carolyn gave a really brief um, introduction. I'm originally a medical doctor by background. Uh, turned management consultant, turned social entrepreneur. So I co-founded Broadreach in 2003 uh, with my best friend from medical school, uh, Ernest Darko, who also happens to be a Fulbright scholar. So um, it, it was, in many respects, I think uh, Broadreach sort of grew out of the ideals um, of the, the Fulbright program. And as social entrepreneurs, we are focused on improving access to healthcare for underserved populations. And we've had the good fortune for almost two decades to do that, mostly in emerging markets. We mostly work in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but have worked in about 30 countries um, around the world. About 1,200 employees today, offices over three continents. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa by far is where the majority of our, our employees are. And what we do just um, really is, is to focus on uh, those delivering healthcare programs. So whether government run health systems, uh, NGO donor run health programs, uh, uh, programs run by the private sector. We work with them by providing consulting services, uh, analytics and data services to help them run their operations a lot more effectively. So if you can imagine in healthcare, uh, for example, South Africa, where we have our largest program, uh, the government runs a healthcare system that has over 5,000 hospitals and clinics hundreds of thousands of employees, including doctors, nurses, uh, community healthcare workers, um, accountants, managers, um, and they are dealing with a population of over 48 million people. So how do you more effectively manage uh, a, a population that large, that complex? And so we're focused on really optimizing a couple of things. Number one, 
bringing together lots of different data because any health system has tons and tons of data, patient lab data, payroll data, all sorts of data, bringing it together so that everyone can start understanding what's actually happening today, what do we need to do about it, and then providing tools to help implement. So really trying to push the efficiency and effectiveness of health systems. So that's the background and sort of how I'm gonna sort of tell the story anecdotally from, from my experience predominantly working in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think the case for optimism is that COVID um, while tragic has pushed many health systems to innovate and adopt fourth industrial revolution technology. What do I mean by fourth industrial revolution? This is a, a, a phrase coined by uh, Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum. And he published a, a book several years ago that says that we are in the midst, the, this next 10 years of the next great industrial revolution. And this, this revolution will be far more powerful and impactful across all aspects of society than we've seen in the previous three. In healthcare, you know, we're gonna see prevention done in new ways. For example, manipulation of the genome <laughs> to prevent diseases that you actually have genes for. Um, we see AI, which we use in particular. Um, you know, we, we work in countries where drones are actually being used, like in Zambia, rural Zambia, drones are being used to deliver medicines to rural clinics. So it's happening. And in our particular focus, we do a lot of work in artificial intelligence. We aggregate lots of data, terabytes of data. Um, we analyze it with algorithms and we use natural language processing to deliver very simple insights to anyone from a minister of health all the way down to a, a community healthcare worker to understand what do I need to focus on? What do I need to do so I can actually help more lives? And we've been very fortunate to partner with Microsoft and we are Microsoft's largest um, sort of healthcare analytics uh, organization in all of Middle East Africa. Okay, so just to give you context, um, you know, we have started, we started out in HIV. So we, with our technology, we call in our world population health services, um, help governments and NGOs manage over two and a half million people, uh, HIV positive people on antiretroviral therapy. We helped over 19 million children with malaria in West Africa. We work in East Africa. Um, with various organizations to help with uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, et cetera. Um, in Zambia, we're rolling out electronic medical health records. In West Africa, we're running large scale immunization programs. These are all being powered by fourth industrial revolution technology. This is stuff that five years ago, we couldn't do at this scale. With the power of AI, with the power of data aggregation, we can do that now. So moving to COVID, um, our experience with epidemics and diseases in general in most emerging markets is that they were managed almost exclusively on paper. So you can imagine in the case of COVID, if you only had paper test results, if you only had paper screening, if you only had paper contact tracing, if you only had paper information that you had to gather up over thousands of clinics, you, and we saw this in Ebola, you would always be two, three, four, five weeks behind actually understanding what's happening. And, and unfortunately, you know, you can't do that in a, in, a, in, a, in a pandemic that's changing on an hourly basis. With fourth industrial revolution, um, and what we saw in, in many countries actually in Africa, technology was actually being used for COVID-19 to gather surveillance data, to actually help with community screening, to help do contact tracing, to help monitor the supply chain. And all these things I think really transformed how we monitored and managed uh, COVID compared to diseases like Ebola or cholera outbreaks in the past. And so uh, I'll talk about our experiences in South Africa. Um, this particular work is, is currently being funded by USAID uh, and PEPFAR. And in South Africa, we're working with two provinces, uh, equivalent of state in the US. So two states, roughly population of 11 million people. And in South Africa, like most resource poor settings, when COVID-19 happened, um, there weren't enough tests. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, what most countries had to um, uh, start with was to actually do screening. So they sent thousands of community healthcare workers into the field, into villages, into townships, going door to door, knocking on doors and taking surveys and asking them, do you have a fever, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you were determined to be a high risk, they would send you to a local community center to get tested. But again, we had to do this because we just didn't simply didn't have enough tests. And so you can imagine in the old days, in the paper-based days, there's no way you can actually monitor and manage what's going on. 
And at the same time, all the hospitals and clinics had to understand what, what kind of medicines did they have in inventory? Did they have enough masks? Did they have enough equipment to deal with COVID? Did they have enough staff? And so at the same time, we had to understand what were the capacities of the clinics and the hospitals and which ones did we need to focus on? And so in, in this new world of fourth industrial revolution, we were able with our technology funded by USAID in partnership with the government of South Africa, actually equip the community healthcare workers to go out and on their mobile phones, do the surveys house by house. And every single survey that was done was automatically uploaded into, um, into our system called Vantage. And it was displayed in almost a, a war center in, in each of the provinces that immediately showed where were the suspect cases. We ran algorithms to identify uh, when those uh, potential hotspots uh, would, would start popping up. And we mapped that against the clinics and the hospitals. And, and we could identify those clinics and hospitals that needed more supplies. So in near real time, we could literally work with government to see what was happening and then make effective management decisions on the fly to address this. And, and um, as we ended that first phase, we ended up capturing over 6 million um, surveys um, and helping them manage. And these two provinces actually ended up um, doing quite well um, across South Africa. So I think there's promise. There's lots of really interesting things happening. And I think, you know, as we hopefully go to this next phase of the vaccine, um, you know, uh, creating a vaccine is just the tip of the iceberg. Getting it out to billions of people across many, many different countries, over 100 plus countries around the world, is incredibly complicated. And it's incredibly complicated at the last mile because you have things like supply chain. How do you track vaccines? How do you keep them cold? How do you deliver them to remote areas? How do you keep track of who's gotten vaccinated, who hasn't, who has had adverse events, who hasn't? Um, how do you actually even create community campaigns so that people um, come and, and actually get vaccinated? These are inc incredibly complicated and they cannot be managed on paper and they cannot be managed on Excel. And so there's a lot of organizations already um, that have done a lot of great work um, in this space. And I do think that um, a lot of these will be applied in the rollout in, in particular in emerging markets that are going to have us be able to immunize lots of people much faster than than ever before so i think you know in conclusion i, I think we've gone through an incredibly disruptive time um, but i think as shakira said as john bader said times of disruption also offer times of hope and a glimpse of the future and they're a forcing function to to sort of make quick rapid changes um, that that ultimately need to happen so i'll stop there thanks Great, John, thank you so much. I am going to make a few comments <clears throat> on higher education in this time of uh, pandemic. Uh, and then we'll, we'll open for general, general questions thereafter. I'd like to focus my comments on three areas. First, what is happening to higher ed as an industry in light of COVID? Second, what is happening within universities? in light of COVID? And then three, what is happening for international education because of COVID? So three areas, I'm gonna make very brief comments. All of these are, I think, very large and complex topics. So uh, please understand my comments are, are brief and, and non-comprehensive. Uh, non I would say the first category, higher ed as an industry, I'm sure if you've you know, read the paper, watched the news, uh, you've seen much about higher ed uh, universities, their ability to start, restart, disperse students to protect health. I think what we do anticipate is a contraction in the number of U.S. higher ed institutions going forward. We hear so often that COVID is accelerating things that were already underway. And I think that is certainly right in terms of many, many colleges and universities in the US who are already facing some challenges with the rising cost of education, uh, with enrollment, hitting enrollment targets and numbers. And so one thing that we're seeing in the industry itself is a real, um, you know, a kind of real response that I think will accelerate futures for better or for worse. One of the things that is also, I think, inevitable because of COVID is that even as many universities struggle to teach their students remotely or bring their students back to campus in a safe way, the global demand for higher education is acute. 
World Health Organization had a global map tra tracking the pandemic and school closures. And what you could see was just, you know, one following the other as numbers went up in nations, school closures went up. And there were huge, huge groups of students, K-12, higher ed, all of whom had their education program interrupted and many of whom did not, uh, did not have the benefit of being in an institution that could make the switch to online or digital. And so as a result of that, some of the innovative digital platforms that had been developed in the last five to seven years stepped in to meet that need. We think here of a Coursera, we think here of an edX, uh, we saw the numbers of students and learners on those platforms skyrocket. We also saw those companies very quickly develop no cost or very, very low cost educational efforts to meet a kind of global demand that had really been unprecedented. And so I would say in education, the industry, we're going to see an acceleration of contraction we're also seeing an acceleration of demand and an acceleration of innovation. And so higher ed, like others on this panel, I would say, you know, higher ed is an industry where there is cause for hope as well as cause for real concern. Moving to the second topic within universities, how are universities managing what is really an unprecedented challenge to student need to staff and faculty uh, physical health realities, you know, and to the urban sometimes or suburban or rural environments in which they are positioned. And I think what we are seeing within universities are dramatic changes in every level of operation. The university that I work at, Rice University in Houston, Texas, we sent our students on an early spring break when Houston started uh, reporting real cases of COVID, this was last March, we extended that spring break. We pivoted from having 1,906 courses delivered face-to-face -to, -face to all of those courses delivered online. And we did that in two weeks. And so when students came back to campus, they came back remotely. Now, the fact of the matter is that faculty, staff, administration, no one thought we could do that. Uh, it was a mission critical and enterprise determinative moment for the institution. Rice is not unique in that we managed to make that move. Uh, it was not without its challenges. One of the challenges I wanna call out is that many of our students, of course, have wonderful infrastructure in their, in their homes. Uh, they have internet access. They have a quiet room uh, you know, to study in. Many of our students don't have those kinds of equalizing access benefits. And so we worked very hard to get uh, internet to students who were in rural areas or um, didn't have sufficient internet capacity or bandwidth in their homes. We worked with WeWork to find access opportunities for students whose home lives did not support uninterrupted engagement in class. Uh, we found ourselves with a long list of student needs and challenges that were otherwise um, invisible to us when students come to campus, live in a dorm room, have a library they can go study in. And so one of the real challenges universities are gonna face moving forward is how do we create equal access and opportunity for all of our students when they are learning remotely. And we anticipate that the spring semester will be much a continuation of what we've had this fall, as we've heard uh, from you know, the, the panel today, this is not going away next month. And so we, we do really focus and concern ourselves with the long-term learning outcomes of students who do not have the, the kind of equal opportunity in their, in their comprehensive home life. And so that's a real priority, I think, within universities. Similarly, I would say universities are looking at our built environment very differently. We're asking, how can we get the most out of our entire infrastructure? 
at my university, we built a number of pop-up spaces. We literally built tents um, on our campus so that we could get more students socially distanced in physical classrooms if they wanted them uh, in a safe way. And that's, as I said, very important for a number of our students uh, who really need to be on our campus. So, uh, you know, we have kept our dorms open for those students who really say, you know, gosh, I just, I need to be there. I want to be there. Uh, it's it's going to be best for me if I'm there. And so I think universities, in addition to access questions for students who are remote, are creating greater access and capacity for students who are on campus. I'd like to end with talking about international education because, of course, 25% of our students are international students. And that's probably pretty typical, um, I would imagine, of many universities, not all, but many. And as you can imagine, our international students have posed a particular set of challenges, but also opportunities. We have hundreds of students dispersed because of COVID who cannot come back to our university. And many of them are, of course, you know, 12, 12 hours away. Um, many of them, because of where they are, have internet issues that are pretty substantial. Um, we have had to develop a series of opportunities for those students. A number of them are in China. We partnered with a Chinese university to create a residential option for those students. So we have a group of Rice students who are living uh, at, a, at a Chinese university right now. They are taking our courses online. Uh, they are able to take one course at that university. Um, and so we are creating these pop-up communities of students uh, supporting them at a distance, figuring out ways to make sure they can get back to Rice safely uh, when opportunity allows, but developing ways to support at a distance over time. I would say the other thing though that's quite optimistic is this is a great chance for students who are at other universities to be able to be in classes with other students at other universities because all of our courses are online. And so we developed a partnership with uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. We have a large cohort of those students sitting in Rice online classes this semester. And they're taking classes in international policy and international relations. They are taking courses on uh, US race and racism. Uh, and so that's great for Rice students because suddenly their classrooms are more international while they're more online, of course. Um, I do think it suggests a paradigm shift. Uh, international education often is thought of as students physically removing to a different part of the globe for a semester or a year. And all of us associated with Fulbright know how important that experience is. There's nothing really to replace that immerse, immersed and fully immersive experience. That said, there are some other opportunities and affordances brought on by digital education, which I think is here with us to stay, even after COVID. I think COVID has opened a, a door we won't probably walk back through, and that is a door where students are more comfortable uh, doing what we're doing right here, right now, right? Taking one course like this or having a digital component even in the residential classes. I think we have breached that divide because of COVID more quickly than we would have otherwise. And I think what that means for international education has the potential to be quite profound. It may mean that it's not either being at home or away, but always engaged with students, with faculty from different universities. And we already see a number of partnerships emerging. Uh, one, for example, with Hebrew University and Rice, where faculty from both universities are co-teaching virtually, blending their students. And then when opportunity allows, those faculty and students will, of course, you know, co-locate. Uh, but in the interim, there's a conversation and a learning going on that I think is quite uh, quite optimistic for the future. So I guess I'm gonna end on an optimistic note like, like so many of our other panelists did. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do while I encourage our audience to uh, 
please put questions in the Q&A, in the chat or the Q&A box, not the chat box. But while you're synthesizing these five, uh, five uh, brief kind of comments on different parts of, of the global pandemic, I thought it might be nice to ask the panelists, um, each of you, if you could say in a couple of sentences, what is the one thing that you would like to see happen as a result of COVID? So five years from now, when I hope we are looking back on this time, is there something that you would like to, to see as part of our, our present five years forward? And maybe if we can just go in the order of each of the panelists, and that'll give our audience a chance to add a few more questions to Q&A before we turn to their questions. So Malik, can I start with you? Um, sure, sure. Um, you know, I think I think much to actually what you were just speaking about, um, Carolyn, I feel like there's such, an, such a push for engagement right now in a way that I haven't really seen. And, you know, with, with Act to Change, when we would do a youth-focused conference in the past, it would be, you know, maybe 50 kids together in a room with one guest speaker. And now with this virtual world, we can have five or six speakers who speak to a broader audience. We can have 50,000 uh, people watch this webinar. And so that that level of engagement is something um, that I think I hope stays stays with us. But I also think a level of engagement around um, around actually like having your voice heard. You know, I'm seeing it on social media so much. I'm seeing it in the engagement around the political process. And, uh, and I think part of that is because this pandemic has had such, had such a profound impact on people's personal lives that it has pushed them to want to uh, have their voices heard. So I hope that stays with us. I hope that especially young people uh, stay engaged when when <laughs> this all, uh, um, you know, is with, with the help of folks like John Sargent is something that we can look back on, so. Great, thanks. Um, great question. And one piece of grounding I do want to offer up is that, you know, we can never go back to normal. I really want to reject that kind of framing because it was never normal for so many of our communities. And actually, we have been living in pandemics within pandemics for decades. Um, and, you know, COVID has exasperated our health disparities. But for so many communities, we've been living in like a slow disaster. Um, and now, you know, that's coming to bear. That's coming to bear. And for some folks, that might be scary. Um, I'm personally excited uh, because I, I, I do think this, that disruption is necessary. Um, I saw a question in the chat that uh, brought the issue of decolonize. And within the next five years, I'm hoping that we decolonize land. Um, actually, I think that conversation is going to be really important. Um, thinking about how we can make sure that when we, you know, we live on stolen land, I think that's really important to acknowledge. We are in Ramatri Shaloni land in, in San Francisco. And if we're able to rethink housing and rethink how we build communities and rethink our economic markets in a way in which we are, that decolonization means that we can have stable communities and stable homes um, for everyone, uh, I think that would be um, incredible. And I think you know, we're, we're, if you live in a big city, particularly in the States, we're coming up against that and seeing how folks are like cancel rent, right? Or, uh, or cancel commercial rent, or how do we, or the rent's too damn high. Um, and I think like, you know, making sure that uh, our equity is not just placed in what we just personally own in personal property, but our equity is also in what we can build as a community and what can be used and stabilized for all. So when I'm thinking about the next five years from now, rejecting going back to normal, think how can we radically imagine new systems that will allow us to decolonize spaces, um, our minds and also lands to make room um, and repair some of the you know, systemic inequalities that we've been sitting in um, for, for decades. So that's my, my radical hope as, a, as an activist and someone who um, sits in this work. Thanks, Kevin. Is that me up next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so look, uh, if I'm allowed to have two hopes, uh, and I, I would put them, I'd put them this way around. First of all, as we think about the economic recovery uh, coming out of the COVID recession, 
that we sort of recommit in a much more serious way to the idea that that recovery has to be inclusive. And it is not just inclusive in terms of results, but also empowering in terms of individuals and communities. So it's not just about delivering better economic results, but it's giving people tools that they need uh, in order to control their own destiny, in order to shape their own lives individually and as communities. My second hope, though, would be that we don't uh, fall into the trap of thinking that uh, private sector dynamism and finance and other things will always be the enemies of those goals. And that's a terrible mistake to make. Uh, what we need is smarter government policy and that can help channel the energy of the entrepreneurs, channel the benefits of finance towards uh, socially uh, desirable goals, you know, whether that is on, on issues of inclusion uh, and opportunity in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, uh, whether it's also in terms of, for instance, having on a different topic, you know, a carbon pricing regime so we can harness the power of capitalism to save the environment. You know, we, we should not fall into the trap of thinking that uh, the answers to everything uh, rely within the remit of government. And uh, nor should we for a moment accept that we can just go back to having private sector uh, you know, uh, profit maximization and, and financial return seeking uh, as a goal in and of itself. So I think it's bringing together the right combination of policy and private sector energy in order to achieve the results we all want to see. Great. It's always hard to go last <laughs> when you have such <laughs> good panelists. Um, yeah, I guess for me, you know, five years from now, I would say um, probably unity and healing. And, and why I say that is that, you know, we're in an incredibly disruptive time. It's disruptive every, every aspect of society. But at the end of the day, we're all on this earth together, right? I mean, the earth, if you can think about it, is a large spaceship hurtling through space and all 8 billion of us are stuck on this thing. So if we don't have unity and if we don't have healing, and we, we don't sit down and actually figure out how to use what's available to us through the fourth industrial revolution, through all, I mean, human ingenuity has created unbelievable tools for us to use. And, and we can do things with climate change. We can do things with healthcare. We can do things with education, but we can't do, we, we can't get those results if we can't work together. And so I think for me, you know, I, I hope coming out of this disruption you know, sort of like what um, John Bader said in the introduction, coming out of World War II, you know, there, there came a, a new world order, um, not perfect, but a new world order that um, hopefully learned on a lot of the disruption that happened in the first and the, the second world war. Great. Well, what I'd like to do now is um, maybe start uh, asking the panelists questions that came out of the audience. Um, and maybe we'll begin with you, Malik. Um, you know, there's questions around how are you reaching young people directly who are facing bullying? What are you doing to help to help those individuals? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because you know it's obviously you never want to be like making noise and hoping hoping someone's listening. You know, so um, I'll, I we're there's a number of things that we're doing that are directly engaged with youth. I actually just dropped something into into um, the chat. We had a group of interns who created a racism as a virus toolkit, and you know while that was uh, three interns, I feel like that has a rippling effect. We're also launching a program uh, with Tan France, who's uh, the Emmy nominated host of Queer Eye where he is um, challenging schools to win a virtual visit with him. And part of what that challenge entails is that schools have to make a commitment to, uh, to increasing uh, the visibility and curriculum inclusion of BIPOC um, representation. So whether that's creating a virtual or physical library that includes more BIPOC authors or um, uh, adding a BIPOC author to uh, to their current curriculum, uh, uh, committing to holding an assembly around bullying or around racism. So that's a, a direct impact. We're launching a digital art exhibit uh, and we're asking young people to submit their their art um, and you know in whatever form that might be. And then I'll, I'll drop in the chat too that we also have um, this youth conference coming up. So a number of our virtual events have obviously just been about uh, elevating the conversation, but this event on Saturday is specifically designed to reach 
directly to youth. And, and to do that, we've uh, engaged a lot of younger uh, celebrities who, who kids really look up to, like Josh De La Cruz, who's the star of Nickelodeon's Blues, Clues, and You, and um, Hudson Yang, who's on Fresh Off the Boat. And we're actually going to have young people be on the panel. So we're, uh, Tan France is leading a panel with uh, young people from one of the schools he's visited to talk about why his visit was important to them. And so we're, you know, we're, we're really trying to uh, make sure that we engage. And the other thing I would just say is social media, you know, all, all, all the young uh, kids are on TikTok and Instagram. And so we're really using those platforms uh, to reach them and help them to, um, to, to have meaningful conversations around the things they're dealing with. Great. And I, I think that connects to some questions that are directed to you, Shakira, which have to do with sort of um, you know, when we're dealing with systemic racism or, or you know, maybe, you know, injustice, uh, you know, to, to any, um, how, um, you know, these touch on many societal issues and are part of society. So how can we, um, one asks, how can we as Fulbrighters best help to address this issue? Another question, Shakira, is how can uh, white, uh, white members of our community who want to be helpful be so? So they're sort of connected questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so a couple of things, you know, being actively anti-racist is, again, a muscle. It's not like you read a book, you pat yourself on the back, and you're done. Um, it's something, and, and think about, it's a privilege to read about racism versus experience it. So I think I, I want folks to understand that um, it happens in cons like concentric circles, right? So there's what can you do to individually um, hold yourself accountable um, to your family, to your kids, um, to your workplace? What kind of environments are you creating in which everyone can feel like they belong and feel included? Um, what kind of decisions are you making at the ballot box um, as it relates to how your community is um, created or zoned that may limit folks who do not look like you? Um, you know, another thing that's deeply uncomfortable, but is super important is, is shifting leadership, ownership, agency, and power to, you know, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. And it means like you're going to have to give something up, right? And I, I think, you know, folks understanding now um, to decenter themselves um, and where your needs are not prioritized right now, I think that is going to be, um, that's inc incredibly important on the interpersonal, institutional, and systemic level. Um, one thing that I think is super important right now, and I, as a person that does work in, in local government, which is really interesting to me because I was used to being on the outside of City Hall, shaking my fist, now I'm inside City Hall, shaking my fist <laughs> at the system. Um, but I would say that, you know, I would love to see um, more folks become civically engaged and democratize um, our education system more than just every four years when people have to vote, right? There's so many decisions that happen on a local level that directly impacts folks' uh, uh, lives. Um, and that is built off of oppressive histories. I talked about redlining earlier. Our cities are still based on those oppressive housing policies, right? So how can we undo that as civically engaged, you know, folks who think local, um, I'm sorry, think globally as Fulbrighters, but act locally as, as civically engaged, actively anti-racist um, individuals. So, I mean, I can put some resources in the chat. Um, it's a journey. Um, but I think it's shifting power, um, decentering yourself, um, thinking about how you can show up locally for your community. Um, and then it's also, you know, it's like what, what kind of power and privilege, privilege will you give up in order to, um, to, um, to make room and think about who needs to be sitting at the table at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to lift up to community here. Good. Krishna, there are two questions kind of interrelated for you. One, um, asking you to address the unwillingness or inability of the private sector, financial institutions to reach individuals, low income, communities of color, um, asking you to comment on how financial institutions can more broadly serve society. And then I think connect to that is uh, the question from someone who is a business person and is interested in your thoughts on 
how individuals within the industry can help dismantle oppressive systems. Oh, I think you are still on mute. Am I unmuted now? Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think the, um, I think it requires both a, a fundamental attitude shift and an acceptance that that uh, promoting equity, and I love the definition of that, equity is not mathematical equality, but equity is justice and, and it's equality of opportunity and equality of standing and participation, you know, in, in the society and in its leadership. Um, it's partly an acceptance that the private sector has responsibilities here uh, and can't just hand them off to activist groups and so forth. It's also, I think, a very patient and unfortunately time consuming um, exercise in trying to build up, if you like, and contribute to and support the infrastructure on the other end, right, that can engage with large scale financial institutions and so forth and, and entities like, say, the Federal Reserve itself. Uh, you know, there are fantastic community uh, CDFIs, community development and financial institutions in low income communities, both low income communities of color, but also, you know, uh, white low income communities that do a, a extraordinary jobs with relatively little resources. And I think we need to you know, invest also in building up uh, those type of entities. And so they can help partner with major financial institutions or with, you know, branches of, of government. Um, economic uh, policy agencies and help to channel, uh, you know, resources into areas and into communities, uh, you know, which have, which start from, you know, a, a hundred yards behind the starting line when it comes to running the race, right? It'd be okay if everyone starts at the, at the starting line, but there are a bunch of people who are starting a hundred yards back. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's, it's a combination of, of wanting to make a difference, but also, uh, understanding that it's part of it's your job. It's not. It's everyone's job. It's not just the job of some specific, uh, you know, entities in society, but also recognizing that that requires investment and work in building up this sort of the, if you like, the, the social and economic infrastructure that can that can help to to connect with, if you like, so-called mainstream finance and leverage it for the for the benefit of those of those communities. Um, you know, look, in, in terms of my own role uh, and, and those of, of you know, like-minded people, I think, you know, it, it starts in terms of, you know, your own organization, your own firm, um, being clear about, you know, what your responsibilities are and who you ultimately you know, are accountable to. It's about, you know, the, the promotion of diversity and inclusion within your organization, um, because, you know, it's, it's not just essential for these social justice opportunities uh, causes, but in the end, it's, it's central to realizing the full promise, uh, the full, you know, commercial and economic promise um, of the country that we give, you know, the, all these brilliantly talented people from disadvantaged communities, you know, the chance to, to show what they can do, to lead, to, to deliver, to invent, to innovate, to employ, um, and so, you know, we need to, as a financial services industry, uh, we need to look like, think like, and feel like uh, the full community that we serve. Um, and that, you know, and then, you know, with the help of that, to, as I said, to pursue a, an inclusive view of business growth and economic development, which in the end uh, should be the best business outcome, the best economic outcome, as well as the best uh, social justice outcome. Um, so that is easier said than done, um, but it's something that we you know, need to redouble our efforts on yesterday. Great, thank you. That, that's terrific. And I think um, leads nicely into a couple of questions for you, John. Uh, one is, you know, the logistics that you're referring to for COVID and a future vaccine, are those relevant uh, for other diseases and health issues? Um, and, and if so, uh, can that work be done concurrently or will it have to wait until after COVID? 
And then I think kind of another great question is what work needs to be done to ensure the impacts of the fourth industrial revolution reach vulnerable communities? I think that's very in line with yeah. the comments we've received so far. Yeah, definitely. So um, maybe I'll, I'll tackle that second question first. Um, I, I think ultimately sort of the overarching concept is you've got to create an enabling environment for this to happen, enabling environment meaning uh, policies, um, you need to make it attractive for investors in private sector, because there's two fundamental problems that we see um, working in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. The first is just access to basic services like the internet. So um, a lot of what we can do with the force industrial revolution requires that you have a smartphone and that smartphone is hooked up to the internet and that you can transmit data. So a lot of our um, community healthcare workers, uh, you know, they didn't have data plans because they couldn't afford it. And so we had to, had to work with government USA to actually buy that. So th there are lots of reasons why, why the data plans are incredibly expensive and, and there's not great access in, in a lot of these markets. And that, create, that, that requires a policy environment where government works hand in hand with private sector, um, with nonprofit sector to, to make that possible. So, so that's one issue. The second issue that we often see is that a lot of the cool adaptations that we get in the US, you know, really complex, expensive MRI machines, um, you know, sort of uh, genomic uh, gene therapy, um, uh, incredible diagnostic equipment, that can work in the US. Uh, it can work in select markets in Europe and Asia because those markets are at a um, uh, sort, sort of a, a price point that, 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 that they will accept those types and they will pay for those types of therapies. But when you're in a rural village in Zimbabwe, you know, gene therapy, you know, that's pretty, probably not going to happen in the next few years. So, so again, the question is, how do you create a policy environment, an enabling environment to allow that to happen? How do you encourage, and what we're seeing, and, and, and I'm part of a, a global group um, uh, in the World Economic Forum, it's the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurs. What we're seeing is um, really in the last five years, an explosion um, of um, local organizations, companies, entrepreneurs that are actually creating sustainable solutions in those markets. And so how do you encourage them to make gene therapy actually affordable in Zimbabwe? How do you encourage them to make drone delivery of essential supplies um, affordable um, and possible? And so those things are happening, um, but it, it requires a, a concerted effort. Um, and then to the first question around the supply chain, um, the good news is all the, these things I described, they're happening now. So um, one of the, the fellow companies in, in the World Economic Forum that we work with, the Schwab Foundation, is a company called Zipline that uses drone technology. And during um, the rainy season in Zambia, as an example, a lot of rural clinics are inaccessible because rivers flood. And so they use the drones to fly in, um, you know, essential medicines, et cetera. Um, other markets we work in, you know, people are creating um, insurance plans that um, people can use digital money and PESA to buy and manage. Um, so it's happening now. There's a lot of interesting cold chain work. There's lots of folks tracking supplies. Um, so I think COVID has actually been the catalyst to make it happen much more quickly um, you know, if, if COVID didn't happen, we probably would have been here for another five years before a lot of these technologies are really adapted scale. I think the COVID vaccination effort will force um, us to adopt these at scale and to use them. Wonderful. That leads us, I think, beautifully into our final question for the full panel, um, which is, you know, technology has been a thread across all of our comments and we have a very astute question from the audience asking, um, how can technology help us in the long term to address our challenges, whether it's health, finance, racial equity, education? Um, and I think that questioner notes that technology, of course, has the great power of good, but also can contribute to things like bullying and um, you know injustice in our community. So uh, I'd like to open that to to anyone who would like to begin how technology might help in, in, your, in your field. Uh, 
Sure, I, I can start. I, I mean, so, so technology is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Technology won't save the world unless you actually have people who clearly understand what your problems are and then use the technology in a way to fix it. So the um, example I like to use as, as a doctor, um, don't treat the symptom, treat the disease. So, you know, I could have a headache and you can say, hey, take this Tylenol, it'll make your headache go away. But that's just treating the symptom. Um, and, you know, I could actually have an aneurysm or a brain tumor, which needs a very different treatment from Tylenol. And so the same thing with technology. Technology is a tool. But if, if you just try to use technology to treat the symptom, you're never going to, you're, you're, you're not going to be successful. You have to understand the underlying root cause issues. So in healthcare, you know, it's, it's one thing um, uh, to say that um, uh, you can't get medicines to a rural clinic. Um, it's another thing to really truly understand why that is. Um, and then once you understand those root cause problems to then figure out which parts of the technology uh, pieces of the fourth industrial revolution, you can apply to solve it. Mm -hmm. Krishna, do you have thoughts on this? Oh, I think you're still muted. Great. So I, I certainly agree with the idea that, you know, technology in and of itself is, is neither a, you know, is neither a force for good or force for evil or anything in between. It's, it's what you make of it. So it's the societal challenge, right, to harness uh, the amazing innovations that are taking place and direct them towards, you know, uh, generating the kind of society that we want to see um, going forward. You know, just to give a, a particular example of that, um, you know, there is, a, as you know, uh, considerable concern as to what happens to a lot of uh, currently important uh, employment opportunities as automation and AI, you know, uh, robotics, uh, you know, take over in the decades ahead, how many millions of jobs will cease to exist. Um, you know, but as a friend of mine always likes to remind me, it sort of depends on who owns the robot. Right? I mean, you know, if if the robots are owned by a very small privileged minority, then that the outcome for society could be, you know, really quite stark. Um, if society as a whole is able to harness the benefits of these technologies and automation in terms of liberating people from drudgery um, and creating vast increases in productivity that liberate people through universal basic incomes or, or other, other you know, policy innovations to live uh, more fulfilling lives, to have more control over their, you know, their lives and, and the way they want to live them, um, then this can be, you know, these that same outcomes can be uh, very powerfully positive, not just at the aggregate economic level, but in terms of how it actually affects people's lives. Great. Other thoughts on the role of technology and uh, social justice, racial equity? Um, I, I can hop in here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is like a, this might be a little bit of a departure from, from the question, but uh, early on when, when COVID hit and, and we were all feeling extremely isolated, I, I think this was like um, end of March or early April, uh, we did a webinar that Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is a Surgeon General under Obama, came to speak on. And he started warning about um, the fact that not only were we in this health crisis and that there was an economic, potential economic recession, I know things have looked a little different than, than we all thought they were going to, but he also warned against a social uh, recession. And he talked about this idea that we're all isolated and we need to find ways to stay connected through that isolation. And I think over the summer, you know, things, things got a little bit better, but I, I live in New York and it's already starting to get cold again. And I think people are, you know, cases are spiking and everyone's very concerned about how um, the next few months are gonna look. Do we have to go back into this kind of isolation? And so what was interesting is here we were using a virtual webinar, a piece of technology to encourage uh, people to find ways to stay out of a social recession. And one of the things that he offered up that I thought was uh, so beautiful was the idea of practicing um, kindness. And so we actually created this thing at the end of every webinar called a kindness table, which is, and the idea was that a parent or a teacher uh, or a student could literally come around a virtual table and come up with one thing they could do to practice kindness that day. And so every panel we did, we would have uh, we would have a different speaker give an idea for what that could be. And the ideas that came out were really unexpected. We had Randall, Randall Park on uh, from Fresh Off the Boat. And he was like, you know, 
give a note to the to the person working at the grocery store who's been an essential worker putting their life at risk and say thank you and everyone kind of laughed and like Are we, should we be handing pieces of paper to each other right now you know is when we were all really freaked out about touch and this idea came out like well what about just taping a note to the inside of your mailbox so that your mail carrier knows that you appreciate the work they do and i think this is so important this idea that we do have to stay um, emotionally connected to other people. We are human beings, we are gregarious by nature. And so I think that using technology as a way to encourage human interaction is something that we should all be considering and looking at. Well, I don't know if we can end on a more positive note than that. And I know that some of our panelists do need to go, they have a hard stop. Um, so I'd like to conclude what's been a wonderful plenary with a, a note of thanks to all of our contributors and also to tell uh, the audience that the, 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 the great conversation goes on. There's a poster fair focused on the impact of the pandemic coming up and we encourage you to attend that as well as the program throughout the next days. Um, but I'd like to give one round of virtual applause to the plenary contributors and, and extend my heartfelt thanks on behalf of the Fulbright Association to you all. All right, see you all soon. Thank you.